probably familiar with the blue crab. Uh, it's so iconic to Maryland that it's almost a symbol for the state of Maryland. But we're not going to talk about blue crabs today because there are a whole host of other crabs that are common to this area as well. And some of them live in pretty strange conditions. Uh, just running down a list of some of these uh, red deep sea crabs that live in the deep ocean, 500 to 1,000 meters deep. Peak crabs that live inside uh, ghost crabs that live in burrows on the beaches and mud crabs that live in the mud or among oysters, but if infected by a parasitic barnacle can become zombies that do nothing but produce more parasites. And there are another, other, a number of other crabs that you would never meet because they live offshore. So let's start with the red deep sea crab, Chason quinquidens. This is a fairly good size crab. As you can see, it's larger than the blue crab. And there is a small commercial fishery for these. These live off the edge of the continental shelf in 500 to 1,000 meters of water. And they have a really unusual uh, lifestyle. Uh, I've done some research on these with a number of my graduate students. And this diagram of the life cycle is based on uh, our work, and particularly one of my students, uh, Stephanie Martinez Rivera. So over a number of years, we sampled for crabs at different depths and looked at reproductive status. And what we found was that typically we find crabs mating, adult males and adult females in six to 700 meters of water. Then the females move upslope to 400, 500 meters where they hatch their eggs. The eggs drift up to the surface uh, I'm sorry, the eggs hatch and the larvae drift up to the surface and then they drift offshore and they settle in really deep water, probably more than a thousand meters deep. We sampled down to 800 meters regularly and a thousand meters a couple of times and we never found a crab younger than three years old. So they're settling way out there in the deep ocean and then they work their way back up slope. So by the time they reach five or six years old, they've come up to seven or 800 meters and they're becoming adults and then they, they start to mate. So they've got this life cycle that takes them up the slope and then they go offshore and then down to the bottom and then they come back up the slope. And the other interesting thing about them is that they live at a constant temperature of six degrees Celsius, winter or summer. The surface waters of the ocean in the summer it can be 10 to 15 degrees down to 200 meters or so. And in the winter, it can be three to five degrees. But down at the depths where these crab live, it is six degrees Celsius year round, which is kind of an unusual thing. But what's even more interesting about them is that they have what we call a biennial reproductive cycle. So it takes them two years to reproduce in their, what we call an odd year, which might be the first year uh, that they reproduce. The females are developing their ovary and then they will mate. And at the end of that year, they'll produce an egg clutch. And then during the even year, they'll carry those eggs for about a year and the eggs will finally hatch the following summer. And instead of producing another clutch of eggs right away, like most crabs do, they'll spend the next year developing their ovary again. So it takes them two years to go through this cycle, which is kind of unusual at the temperatures where they live. Six degrees Celsius is not that cold for most ocean crabs. And most crabs that live at those temperatures have a one year cycle. Crabs may have a two year cycle, but generally those are crabs that are living in really cold water like snow crabs that live below two degrees Celsius. So it's, it's kind of unusual. And it might suggest that they have limited food resources, but uh, I've seen images on the seafloor 
and they're fairly abundant so you wouldn't think they would be that abundant if they had limited food so it's a puzzle it's a conundrum we don't know why they do this very interesting and unusual um, here's some photographs taken by a NOAA research vessel we think of these crabs as living mostly on mud and sand on the seafloor but they also live on rocky bottoms like this and they live in canyons off the coast where they might even be on vertical rock walls like this one they're sharing with these large bubblegum corals our sampling was done on NOAA ships and in some places we caught almost nothing but crabs like this picture shows this is a, a, a toe that we did at night and we just we filled the deck up with with red crabs I've had a number of students work on these and uh, two of them, uh, Dr. Stephanie Martinez Rivera and Dr. Shadisha Green uh, completed their PhDs studying the reproductive cycles of these crabs. There is a fishery for these crabs and it is typically uh, conducted on ships like this. This is the Hannah Bowden. If you ever read or saw the movie, uh, The Perfect Storm, this is one of the boats that was in that movie. It's not the one that sank, obviously. But uh, this, this boat was uh, captained by um, uh, a woman whose name was Linda Greenlaw, I believe. And uh, anyway, this boat is now a crab boat operating out of New Bedford or Hampton, Virginia. And we spent some time working on this boat. They go out for about a week at a time they set these top loading traps up to 60 traps on a two mile long line in 2,000 feet of water that's really deep fishing then they haul them up and they sort the crabs on deck and eventually they deliver them to shore where they're cleaned and processed into sections i have not seen these in a market anywhere but i did run into uh someone selling them in Portland, Oregon, of all places, uh, where they were putting them into uh, crab tacos. <laughs> but they're very tasty crab. I, I don't know if you'll see them in the market, but, but they're very good to eat. Now, we're going to jump from the deep sea to very shallow waters and very microscopic almost crabs and talk about the pea crab or the oyster crab, known to scientists is as Zaops ostrium. If you are a fan of raw oysters like I am, you'll eventually encounter pea crabs or oyster crabs. It's a little soft bodied crab that lives inside the body of a bivalve, usually an oyster, but it might be a mussel or a scallop. Technically, they're a kind of a parasite called a kleptoparasite because they steal food from their hosts. But otherwise, they don't do much harm. And many oysters can have two or more of them. Pea crabs are most common in wild oysters in warmer waters. In the Chesapeake Bay, they're more common in oysters from the James and York River areas. They're much less common in farmed oysters because those have usually been hatched in hatcheries where they're not subject to invasion by pea crabs. In the Delaware Bay, male pea crabs leave their oyster hosts at about one year of age and they go out looking for love you've heard eat pray love while well, these crabs search mate and die after they find a female in another oyster they mate with her and then they die the females can live two to three years and grow to about nine millimeters which is less than half an inch they start producing eggs in june or october which develop for three to five weeks then hatch into larvae, which are free swimming in the plankton for another three to four weeks. And then those larvae start invading oyster hosts in late summer as little crabs. The females will never leave the oyster or bivalve that they infest. And so they don't need a hard exoskeleton. But the males do need a hard exoskeleton because they have to go out, leave their host and, and look for a mate. It's a hard life. You probably won't encounter pea crabs in restaurants because 
The oyster shuckers will most likely have picked them out. Most people don't like to see these in their oyster, but actually the presence of a live pea crab means the oyster was processed and refrigerated properly, so consider that a good sign. <clears throat> now, when Bronwyn first contacted me, she wanted me to talk about pea crabs and, and asked about uh, George Washington's relationship. Someone has said that George Washington was a fan of these, but I didn't find any evidence to support that. However, they have been featured in uh, recipes and in the New York Times as far back as 1907. A cookbook published in 1901 had 16 different recipes for pea crabs. If you go look at the websites of some local oyster processors, you'll, you'll see uh, recipes for these. You can eat them live. If you're eating raw oysters, you can just pick up the crab and, and wolf it down. Chew it if you want, or just swallow it whole. Um, some people like them battered and fried or steamed and mixed with mayo, but you'd have to shuck a lot of oysters in order to get enough to make a meal out of these guys. If it were me, I would probably just add them to soup, throw them in the soup like, like oyster crackers. In fact, they'd probably be good in oyster soup. I've also been involved in some research on pea crabs. I had a PhD student who spent 20 years studying scallops up in Nantucket Bay in Massachusetts. And she always noted whether there were pea crabs in the scallops she was studying. And last year, she sent me all this data and we analyzed it. And what we found was that the gonads, that's the reproductive organ in the scallop, was smaller in those scallops that had pea crabs in them. And the difference was about 15%, which I calculate to be about the volume of the pea crab. So we think that the pea crabs are just displacing parts of the gonad. The gonad is an organ that can shrink and grow as it develops and they spawn. So once the crab gets in there, the gonad just can't grow around it. And it's not stealing nutrients from the scallop as far as we can tell, but it is affecting the size of the gonad. We don't know what that means for reproduction, whether it really impacts them or not. Uh, the number of scallops with pea crabs isn't that high, so it probably doesn't have any major impact on reproduction. Now, if you have spent any time on the Assateague beaches, you've probably seen these little guys called ghost crabs. These are small two to three inch crabs. Their names are uh, Ossipity quadrata, which means swift footed square shell. And they live on beaches from Rhode Island to Brazil. They're often overlooked by tourists and beachgoers and fishermen, but they're really important denizens of beaches. And their burrows are easily identified to a round hole about the size of a quarter next to a small mound of sand. And it may be surrounded by tracks that they make during foraging. The name ghost crab refers to the fact that they're kind of pale white or sandy color, and they have a habit of running across the beach at night. In fact, some people like to go out with flashlights and hunt for these things at night, not to catch them or just to, just to, just to see them. They're kind of fun little critters. They dig burrows that can be three to four feet deep and shaped like an I, a straight tube, or a V, an L, or a W. They typically stay in the burrows during the day. You may see a few of them out and about, but most of them are down in their burrows. They close the entrance to trap moisture, and they typically come out to feed after dark. Then at sunrise, they dig a new burrow. They rarely ever return to the same one. They can stay out of water for extended periods of time, and they can absorb some water, some moisture from the lining of their burrows, but they typically need to get wet every now and then. So you'll see them run down to the ocean and just take a little dip and shake it off and run back up the beach. They can drown if they stay underwater too long. Ghost crabs typically have one claw larger than the other and it may be the right claw or the left claw. Different beaches may have different ratios of right-handed or left-handed claws, and they will defend their burrows uh, 
by ritualized fighting with their claws, but right-handed crabs will only fight other right-handed crabs. They won't fight left-handed crabs because that puts them at a disadvantage. So they tend to avoid each other. And they, they do this by forming like castes in which one group, the right-handed crabs may be active at different times than the left-handed crabs. So they, they kind of avoid each other. Now they have really interesting mating rituals. And in my career, I mostly studied the reproductive biology of crabs because I found it really interesting. And, and crabs can be very complicated when it comes to mating. Um, they don't hear very well, but they can communicate using a process called stridulation. That is, they have a little ridge on the claw that they can scrape across the base of the leg, causing it to vibrate. And they can detect these low frequency vibrations by uh, a motion sensor on their fourth leg. During mating season, crabs will wander the beach and enter other burrows looking for mates. Uh, crabs in the burrows, if, if a male is going into a burrow and there's another male in there, that male may come out and defend his burrow by stridulating or rapping on the burrow walls with his claws or uh, coming out and, and running around the other crab. We call this singing and dancing. He will sing and dance to defend his burrow. They can also create sound by grinding teeth in their stomach in an organ called a gastric mill. It sounds like a dog growling. I was gonna include a link to that, but oh, there is a link in this PowerPoint, but I don't think I'm gonna take the time to do it. If you listen to it, it sounds literally like a dog growling. I was down on the beach one day and I was watching crabs moving around and trying to go into other burrows. Now, in the water, crabs can tell the sex of another crab using uh, odors. They have very good sense of smell. But out on the beach, they probably can't smell each other. So they've got to use visual cues. I don't know what they are. I can't look at that crab on the surface and tell the male from the female. I can if I turn it over. But imagine this male going up to the burrow and, and starting to go in there. And I, I wonder if he knows the gender of the crab who's in there before he goes in or whether he's just guessing and he goes in to find out. I imagine them using some sort of crab tender. Swipe the right claw and get invited inside. Swipe the left claw and, well, he must be disappointed. His, but the invited guest was in for some crabby delights. These crabs are the largest invertebrates on some beaches. And they are what we call apex predators. They feed on mole crabs and small bivalves. Here's a picture of one eating a mole crab. And I didn't even include mole crabs in this talk. I should have. That's a, another study in interesting lifestyles. Um, ghost crabs are preyed on by birds, raccoons, and, and burrowing owls. And they are what we call ecosystem engineers because they, the burrows they dig help aerate the soil and help recycle nutrients. They tend to be more abundant on beaches that are wilder, uh, whereas human disturbance, such as driving on the beaches or raking the beaches or just a lot of people on the beaches tends to displace them and causes them to, to move off into less, less suitable habitat. Uh, one thing we can do to help conserve their populations uh, they're probably not in any danger except in places like Ocean City. But what we can do is uh, limit off-road vehicle traffic uh, at night. And in fact, if you go down to Assateague, uh, they do not allow you to drive on the beach at night uh, because that's when the crabs are out scurrying around. Uh, we want to maintain diversity on the beaches, uh, of course, because that provides more support for fish and bird populations, and that makes it more enjoyable for us. And, and that's why we go there in the first place. Now I'm going to talk about the infamous zombie crab. I don't know how many of you people have seen the, the movie Alien, which is about 30 years old now. But imagine if aliens were to land on Earth and infect your body, then 
take over complete control and turn you into a living, breathing zombie whose only purpose was to produce more zombies. And then a giant egg sac would pop out of your stomach and hang there while thousands of little zombies squirmed within it and eventually it would burst open and release them all. That sounds pretty horrible, but that's exactly what happens to a species of crab in the bay called the mud crab. This little crab is called the uh, white fingered mud crab, Rithropanopius harrisi. If you've ever picked a bushel of oysters, you may have seen these little guys. They're no bigger than your fingernail scuttling about. And this crab plays host to a species of parasitic barnacle that is invasive not only invasive of the crab but invasive of the chesapeake bay the barnacle is known as loxophylacus panopii or just loxo for short and it doesn't look like the kind of barnacle that grows on your boat or grows on docks in fact as an adult you can't even see it because it's totally inside the body of the crab these things are really common in the gulf of mexico and they were not very common in Chesapeake Bay until the 1960s. Uh, at that time, people started moving oysters, transplanting oysters from the Gulf of Mexico into the Chesapeake Bay to help enhance local populations. But hidden among them were hitchhikers, including uh, mud crabs, and some of those were infected with loxo. Dr. Amy Fowler is a scientist at George Mason University in Virginia, and she's made a career of studying these things. The life cycle starts when a free swimming larva, is what you see here, penetrates the body of a recently molted crab. And once inside, it takes over complete control of all the internal organs, including the nervous and the reproductive systems. Regardless of whether the host crab is a male or a female, it turns the crab into a machine for producing more parasites. In order to protect the parasite eggs, the normally narrow abdomen of a male crab expands and becomes, this process is called parasitic castration. Then the male larva comes along and inserts what are called trichogon cells into the female uh, barnacle larva. And these become testes, which then fertilize eggs of the female. Eventually, the female produces a big egg sac with thousands of little eggs in it. And that sac eventually ruptures, releasing thousands of larvae. More research on these has been done at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center by uh, Dr. Monica Noble. She uses citizen scientists to collect these uh, by placing uh, oyster shells in milk crates. And she's found that the parasitic barnacle can produce a new egg sac called an externa every five or six days. And a crab, an infected crab may carry two or three of these, even up to as many as six, each from a separate infection. Most of these parasites occur on crabs in high salinity areas in Chesapeake Bay. That's mostly south of the Chop Tank River. But in those locations, up to 90% of Chesapeake Bay mud crabs can be infected. This is really high. In their native habitat in Florida, Typically, only 5% of the crabs are infected. So CERC, uh, the Smithsonian Institute, is now trying to compare the genomes between our local crabs and the crabs down in Florida and the Gulf of Mexico and see what's different about them. And they're wondering if local crabs could become less susceptible to infection. These crabs are also ecologically important in oyster beds. They eat a lot of worms and little crustaceans. They eat baby oysters too, which helps clear up space for other oysters to grow. So in that process, they help clean shells, they improve oyster growth, and they're an important food source for fish. But 
if the parasite caused widespread castration of these little crabs, that could have a major impact on the Chesapeake Bay ecosystem. Mud crabs are not the only crabs that are affected by LOXO. In the Chesapeake, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, there's a similar parasite that causes castration of blue crabs. Dr. Fowler considers these crabs to be a good model for parasitic invasions. And if those uh, other parasites that affect blue crabs got into this Chesapeake Bay, it could wreak havoc among Chesapeake Bay crab populations. There are other zombie crabs as well. These are not in Maryland. They're out in the Bering Sea. These are golden king crabs, and they're also affected by a similar, what we call rhizocephalan barnacle. Uh, and here is a picture showing golden king crab with up to three different external egg sacs on it. Typically, uh, in their native habitat, the parasites only affect up to about 5% of the crabs. But if they become invasive, they get transported to a new location where they have different conditions and fewer predators, they can run amok and they can uh, become, uh, well, like the local mud crabs, they can infect 90% of the population. And, and it can spiral out of control and become an ecological disaster. And we don't want that to happen here. Those are the four crabs that I really wanted to focus on tonight, but there are lots of other crabs in Maryland that are interesting. A few of these are also invasive. Uh, these are shore crabs, the green crab, Carcinus manus, and the Asian shore crab, Hemigrapsis sanguineus, have invaded the United States from, the green crab came from Europe, the Asian shore crab obviously came from Asia, and they've come in the ballast water of ships and they've invaded virtually every shoreline in the US. You won't find too many of them in the Chesapeake Bay because they typically live under rocks. So they're more common up in New England, Massachusetts, Connecticut, those kinds of areas with rocky shorelines. But you may find them around here under riprap or where people have put concrete out in, in front of, uh, you know, along the shorelines. Ah, and here's that spider crab. This guy is called Rochinia crassa. This is a deep sea spider crab. Um, we've collected these from 500 meters on down to 1,000 meters. This big guy is a male. His, uh, the leg segments you're seeing there are probably about eight inches long. The smaller ones are females. Another similar crab is this little thing called the pinch bug or squat lobster. It's actually only about the size of a quarter, so it's pretty small, but they're fairly abundant out there at those depths. There are other relatives of the blue crab here as well. Both of these crabs have the paddle-shaped uh, leg on, on their fifth leg. You can see that there. One is called the deep sea swimming crab, Bathonectes longispina, and you can see it has the spines sticking out from the side kind of like a blue crab. The other one is called the rough lady crab, Ovalippes stevensoni. You won't see these in the markets, but they're out there on the shelf. And there are also uh, some other edible crabs. The one on the left is the Jonah crab, Cancer borealis. The one on the right is the rock crab, Cancer irratus. Uh, Jonah crabs have become uh, increasingly valuable in the last decade as the New England lobster populations started collapsing and the fishermen up there wanted to catch something. They started landing Jonah crabs and the catch of Jonah crabs has just skyrocketed since 2010. Um, NOAA put a management plan into place for Jonah crabs uh, about five years ago and the fishermen can only keep them if they are also fishing for lobster. They are strictly caught as bycatch. Um, I had a student studying these, and we went to a meeting with a representative, a biologist from the Department of Natural Resources, and some local fishermen. And the biologist was 
brought in a bucket with some crabs and he was showing the fisherman how to tell the difference. And he said, here's a Jonah crab. And my student and I said, nope, wrong. That's a rock crab. Even the local biologist couldn't tell them apart. So I had an undergraduate intern one summer and I assigned him to figure out how to tell these crabs apart easily. I can do it by looking at them. There are differences in color and texture, but that's not apparent to some people. What we did find though, was that the Jonah crab has the first leg shorter than its claw. But if you look at the rock crab, the first leg is longer than the claw. That's a really easy way to tell them apart. They're also different in size. I adjusted these photographs to sort of give you that impression. The Jonah crab is maybe five inches across. The rock crabs are typically only three to four inches across. Okay. If we go farther offshore and even deeper, Maryland has its very own king crab. It doesn't, it's not specific to Maryland. They live up and down the coast, but these do exist off Maryland. This critter is called Neolithodes grimaldii. And these photographs were taken during some deep offshore exploration by NOAA using a remotely operated vehicle or ROV. I spent some time observing these dives and logging the crabs that they observed. And I was pretty certain this was Neolithodes grimaldii, but I thought I would check with the Smithsonian Institute. They had recorded two species from this area, Neolithodes grimaldii and Neolithodes agassizii. As adults, I can tell them apart easily. The one on the bottom has a lot more small spines than the one on the top. But the Smithsonian collections were full of juveniles, and the juveniles, you can't tell the difference between these two species. So they were logging them. And these collections were made 100 years ago, and people were recording them as either one of either of these species. But in reality, all of the species north of Cape Hatteras are Grimaldii. So I had to correct, correct the collections there in the Smithsonian. I think that brings me to the end of my presentation, and I haven't covered all the crabs. I didn't cover mole crabs or fiddler crabs or hermit crabs. There are so many crabs and so little time, but maybe that can be the topic of another presentation. Thank you, Dr. Stevens. That was phenomenal. Um, let's you already come back together. We're going to do some Q and A now. Let me put a spotlight on you. Um, put in the chat box what your favorite crab is that um, Dr. Stevens talked about. Let's see if there's a consensus on that. Let's get the spotlight. All right. Now, do we have any questions? And I'll start. I I, I don't know if I understood correctly the mud crab. The um, with the um, the zombie crab, was it just the infected crabs that came over, or was were there mud crabs here um, in previous, and it was just the introduction of the fungus through a different mud crab? That was my confusion. Or did mud crabs not exist here until they came over? Yeah, the the mud crabs are uh, natural to the Chesapeake Bay, uh, but. Uh, The parasite, the parasitic barnacle was introduced in some mud crabs that came up attached to oysters that were transferred into the Chesapeake Bay. So the crab was here already, the barnacle was not. All right, and then, um, yeah, so Jillian says that her favorite is the pea crab and that's what got me started on, on this and finding somebody who knew anything about pea crabs and oyster crabs and when I saw that thing about Was uh, George Washington, I had to know. Now, it being in a in the cookbooks, I mean, w would you think that you know, a hundred years ago, or two hundred years ago, or three hundred years ago, the prevalence was higher, or because the oysters were bigger, there were more of the pea crabs in it, so they, they were, it was more of a, a thing. I I would say it had more to do with the size of the oyster harvest. Our oyster harvest today is less than a percent of what it was 100 years ago. 
So they were harvesting and processing a lot more oysters, a hundred times more oysters, and therefore probably encountering these. So let's do something with them. Well, and David has a question. Must pea crab larvae enter the oyster in the spat stage? Uh, yes, they typically do. They enter the oyster uh, when it is a spat or juvenile. Um, and that's because primarily uh, that's the time of year. Uh, oysters settle down in July, August, and they're just getting big enough by late August, September for that crab, little crab larva to get in there. If they were to do it, if they're trying to invade a larger oyster, it's more likely that there's going to be a, a bigger crab in there already. Now, do any of the crabs, uh, I know that you mentioned in the first one that they might, that, do any of the crabs migrate um, seasonally? I mean, like the ghost crabs, are they there year round in the winter? It doesn't, does it doesn't deter them? They don't go anywhere, although they may uh, stay in the groves more, uh, and when it's colder, they aren't as active, so you probably won't see them as much. You'll see them a lot more in the spring and the fall. Um, that's true most of the crabs around here. Blue crabs do migrate up and down the bay, but most of these other crabs typically just pretty much stay in one place, except for the red deep sea crab, which has what we call an ontogenetic migration, that is, it moves upslope over its life cycle, but it doesn't, as far as we know, it doesn't make annual migrations up and down the slope or up and down the coast for that matter. So once it's an adult, it stays upslope the whole time. Yes, pretty much. That's what we think. But these are out in the deep ocean, so they're hard to study and there's a lot we don't know about them. Well, that picture of y'all on the boat with the boat full of them, it seemed like they were, they were just, you know, crazy. What, did y'all eat any of them, and were they good tasting? Uh, we did eat a few, and they are very good tasting. They're very similar to this. Where is he? There's a guy. This guy back here. <laughs> I don't know if you can see him, but there's a Dungeness crab behind me on the shelf. That guy is from Alaska, and he is probably about as wide as this shelf strut. He's about nine inches across. Uh, it tastes a lot like that. Very good to eat. And are all crabs edible? I mean, you're not going to, or is it just a matter of what kind of uh, the amount of meat you're going to get? Like you said that people catch the, the ghost crabs, but they're not going to eat them. Is that just because they, there's not well, enough there? Or? My attitude is you can eat anything once. <laughs> Whether you want to do it again, it's, it's another story. I, th I think it really amounts to how much meat you get out of it. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that people fish Jonah crabs. It's a fairly good sized crab. You get a lot of meat out of it, but not rock crabs because they're just too small. And I, I hate to be biased, but I spent 20 something years in Alaska studying king crabs where one leg is just pop it off and that's a meal. And then I move here and I see these little blue crabs and I'm disinclined to pick the meat out of those because it's just so much work. <laughs> so um, Jillian asked, do the megal uh, I don't know how to say the megalopa or megalopa stage migrate in the water column during the night in, in black water dives, sometimes megala stages of other crab species migrate up in the water uh, column at night, the megalopa. Aha, uh -huh. here we have a crab scientist who knows the term megalopa, because I don't think I even said that. The megalop stage is the, uh, it's a post larva. Some people consider it to be the last larval stage, but it's really a post larva. Like the larvae, it can swim, but it's, its function really is to find habitat and it will go down to the bottom and look for habitat. Uh, so I don't know what species you're referring to right now, but most crab megalope are up in the water column swimming around. The blue crabs go offshore and then they get swept back into the bay uh, 
uh, we think the red deep sea crab are swimming around out there too and eventually settle to the bottom. I have actually also seen crab megalope hitchhiking on jellyfish offshore. So if you're a diver and you go offshore, or, you know, look at the jellyfish. Or even on the beaches, if you find jellyfish, you will probably find crab megalope hitchhiking on them. Yes, there are spider crabs uh, in Massachusetts off Martha's Vineyard. And those are, uh, oh gosh, the name escapes me. It's uh, Labinia emarginata is the spider crab up there. And they are about the size of your fist. Yeah. And the fishermen hate them. They just get in the traps. The, the legs are about the size of a pencil. There's no meat in them. So they just throw them away. What, uh, what kind of, I know that you're, you're retired, but that doesn't mean that you're not still involved. Um, what, are there any students working on any um, uh, crab uh, studies right now that you can think of that are interesting? Um, I, I retired in uh, 2021. And I still had a couple of students that uh, were working. Um, many of my students are still publishing work that we did together. Uh, my last student actually studied settlement of oysters in the Maryland coastal bays. And we just got that paper uh, accepted into a journal. So good for her. I, and I have one other student who hasn't finished her PhD and is kind of dragging things out. But like uh, Bronwyn said, I always told my students, study something you can eat. Because at the end of a long day, you get a bunch of crab legs on deck. That's dinner. Uh, you go out and study plankton. Mm, I'm not going to eat those. Are there any um, big questions about uh, the crabs that you'd like to see answered or we're trying to find out? Oh, mostly it has to do with sustainability. How sustainable are these crab fisheries? Um, Tom Miller, who is the director of the Chesapeake Biological Lab down at Solomon's and is also the, uh, I'm not sure the exact title, but he's like the chairman of the Blue Crab Stock Assessment Panel for Maryland. Uh, he and I wrote a book chapter looking at sustainability of all the world crab fisheries. And we looked at 35 fisheries, all of which had landings over a thousand tons. And we, we graded them, we rated them based on how sustainable we thought they were. And we gave top ratings to the blue crab fishery, but look what's happened to blue crabs. Now, um, this year is not a good year, but we don't think it's, it has to do with management. They seem to be well managed. Uh, nature can throw tricks at you. Uh, climate change does weird things. And every now and then they just have a bad year, but it doesn't mean that it's the population is necessarily in danger. Crabs produce a lot of eggs and a lot of larvae. Most of them do. Most of the shallow water species, blue crab produce millions of larvae. In the lifetime of a blue, female blue crab, she can produce 5 million larvae easily. And only two of those have to survive to replace their parents. Uh, in a good year, you know, maybe those two will survive. Maybe none of them will survive, but, uh, it, it only takes a few. And if they have, if 10 of them survived in one year, they could replace that population 10 times over. So I tell people that manage crabs, don't, don't focus so much on the size of the population, unless you've got some really long-term trends. King crab and snow crab out in the Bering Sea have been headed downwards for the last decade. I think that's a climate change issue and I don't see a solution there. I think blue crab is just, they've had a couple of bad years. Uh, they could easily pop back up. Uh, I don't worry about them unless the females are not getting fertilized. When we look at the females, we want to make sure that they're carrying as many eggs as they should, that every female is, is carrying a large clutch of eggs. 
If that's happening, then there's enough males around to fertilize them. If it's not happening, it's an indicator there are not enough males, and that's a problem with the fishery. That doesn't seem to be happening here in the Chesapeake Bay. So I'm crossing my fingers that it's just temporary. They had a couple of bad years, and they can probably recover. I think we're all we're all crossing our fingers and hoping that um, makes me nervous to, to and guilty when I go out and eat crabs or oysters. Speaking of which, are there any uh, you know we we do aquaculture in terms of oyster production. Is there something similar that's being done with crabs in terms of fisheries? Uh, it has been done. Uh, there was a program to cultivate blue crabs in Chesapeake Bay that was being done. Oh gosh. 20 years ago uh, between the uh, Smithsonian and uh, CERC, as they call it. And uh, what we now know is IMET, the Institute for Marine and Environmental Technology, part of the University of Maryland uh, up in Baltimore. They have a big uh, seawater lab and they were cultivating crabs and releasing them experimentally to see if they would survive. And they did, they survived very well. But in order to do that, on a production basis, you have to release millions, literally millions of crabs, because everything eats them. Striped bass, spot, toadfish, everybody will eat little crabs. And their survival rate is pretty poor. You have to release millions of them. And that's an expensive project. It would take a lot of money. And it probably isn't going to happen unless the industry would get together and say, we, we want to fund this. Uh, I spent a year in Japan studying king crab aquaculture, and when I came back to Alaska, I started a cultivation program there that is still going on, and it's also still experimental. They've released small king crabs. They've seen that they can survive well, but again, they would have to release millions of them to make it have any impact on the population, and it's very expensive, and it would cost a lot of money. Julian asked, um, are, there, are you seeing the same decline in marine arthropods that we're seeing in terrestrial arthropods? Uh, I would say no. And I, I'm pretty sure that terrestrial arthropods are suffering from impacts that we have caused, like uh, bees that can suffer from pesticide uh, abuse and other insects also uh, suffering from either pesticides or chemicals or just habitat destruction. Fortunately, we haven't destroyed too much of the ocean habitat yet. Uh, so we're not seeing similar things in the marine environment. But we do have impacts. Uh, we're putting microplastics in the ocean and they are showing up in everything. Scallops, crabs, oysters, you name it, it's got microplastics in it. Um. <clears throat> Are any of the crabs that you mentioned or any of the crabs that you didn't mention that are in this area threatened or endangered or any, 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 in any form or fashion? Are they kind of doing pretty well, except for the, the fungus barnacle? I, I would not say they're threatened. Uh, we're concerned about two of the fisheries. One is the red crab fishery because it's really, we don't know what the populations are and we don't know what impact the fishing is having on the population. It's just a big unknown. So we're a little worried about that one. And the Jonah crab, because they were just catching so many of them without any regulation in place. Um, two of my students uh, worked on studying the size at maturity. How big are they? before they mature so that we could try to use that information to set size limits for the fishery. And I think that they've done that now. They've put some size limits on it. So that will help. But that fishery was out of control as of several years ago. And I'm a little worried about that one. Any other questions for Dr. Stevens tonight? Will crabs throw anything at him? Um, and uh, any questions about crabs, you have them. You could raise your hand, I'll unmute you, or you can put it in the chat box. Well, let me take this moment to just throw in a plug since I've retired. One of the things I'm doing is writing uh, 
some environmental articles for some local newspapers and magazines. I think I've got one coming out in the Bay Journal soon, which is sort of a rebuttal to Andy Harris's claim that wind turbines are killing whales, which they're not. That could be the subject of another talk entirely. But um, I'm publishing a column on Substack called Ecologist at Large. And I put articles up once or twice a month. And uh, if you're interested in reading about marine science and marine critters in the area, uh, look me up. Ecologist at Large on Substack. I should put a little blurb right, in here, a little thing. You should. You should put it put it down in the in the chat box because uh, I just wrote it down on pencil with a piece of paper next to me, old school style. Um, yeah, I agree, Doris. We, we have to have Dr. Stevens back, maybe, and uh, he's over there. Where you're? Where are you on the um, eastern shore? I'm in Salisbury. Salisbury. Okay. All right. So if you're in Salisbury, go knock on Dr. Stevens' door and have some <laughs> talk some more crap. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Thank you everybody for coming and thanks, thanks for and joining us. Getting smarter with us. Um, Jillian wants to hear more about crabs. Everybody's saying thank you, thank you, thank you. We're gonna look you up on Substack and and don't be alarmed if you get another email ask for me uh, to come back and teach us some more stuff because you are a treasure and we really, really appreciate learning from you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate being here. All right, everybody, stay well, stay curious, stay outside. Um, and let's see how many of those crabs we can we can find this summer. Um, while some we're out some people have life lists of birds. I have a life list of crabs. Oh, there we go. Something new to, to, to put up there. <laughs> and I think that there's about 5,000 different types of crabs. I don't know if, how many you've, you've gotten off of that list already. I, I get into arguments with my scientist friends about what is a crab? What defines a crab? We, we, we argue about that still. Crab that in Baltimore. Uh, I don't know. Go to a beach. <laughs> Any place you find riprap or docks, you're going to find crabs. All right, everybody, happy crabbing out there. Happy summer. Uh, it, it feels like summer, at least. Um, and we'll talk to you. We'll hopefully we'll see you next week when we learn all about the art of the bird before Audubon. Uh, take care, everybody. Okay, thank Good you. Night.